Welcome all you multifamily maniacs. I'm Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. All right, we got a very exciting show for you today. Today, we're going to be asking the question, how do you use your retirement accounts to invest in multifamily real estate? So our guest today is a best-selling author in personal finance. He's rewriting the rules and plans for retirement. He has written several books, but the most recent is the QRP book with new 2020 rules. He is a financial mentor and host of the Financial Underdogs podcast. He is an American sensei with a fifth degree black belt who created and founded <laughs> Yokido, if I'm saying that correctly, which is a blend of martial arts, Aikido, and yoga. That's pretty interesting. He's the creator of Black Belt Wealth, personal mission to free 1 million people from financial bondage. You can find out more about him and how to invest with him on DamianLupo.com. We'd like to welcome Mr. Damian Lupo. Gentlemen, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to dive in retirement accounts and how we can use that for, to fund multifamily real estate deals. Yeah, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you joining us today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. I think there's going to be a lot to do. I, in fact, given where we're at and, and uh, the market's going crazy and, and people kind of paying attention to other things right now, trying to figure out what's up and what's down, I think there might be a million people that we can, uh, we can break some shackles on this week. Oh, awesome. man. Yeah, that's yeah, right. <laughs> and who better to talk about it than the man that wrote the book, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so Damien, do you have a favorite real estate quote? Well, the, the quote is, is really just an idea. And the idea is okay. that wealth is not cash. It's not cash flow. And I used to say it was confidence. And I kind of have a hybrid on that now. It's confidence because of the experiences you've had based on the mistakes you've made. And really what that means is that you're not going to get wealthy with, with cash or, or assets. It's going to be the experiences. And so if, if you say, well, what does that exactly mean? It means go out there and do something and, and stub your toe, bleed in the streets. And what you're going to realize is that the more you do that, the wealthier you get. And even if it, all the money goes away, your wealth it has already expanded. So you can have a zero on your balance sheet right. and your wealth has expanded. And people don't realize that. They think, oh, I just want to hit the lottery. I'm like, yeah, but you're still poor. It's because you don't have any experience and you haven't done anything. And they say, well, I'm just going to be a passive investor. And I'm like, you're still poor, even if you have a whole bunch of passive income. And they don't get that because we have this, this like hacking mentality. And as much as I love Tim Ferriss, you cannot hack your way to wealth in four hours. Like it's going <laughs> to take some time and it's going to take some blood and some sweat and, and it, it's not going to kill you. It's like the coronavirus. It's probably not going to kill you. Give me a break. Like just chill out for a little bit. You're going to be okay. Holy cow. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, that, I that, that's, that. that's great. It's great. And uh, you know, based on your, because we, we did some research and based on your background, you are the perfect person to, to, to really talk about that kind of mindset, right? So what do you tell us, tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, Damien? Well, I mean, I'm just the guy that went out there and said, I don't really buy into these rules, meaning like any of the rules that are told to us as a kids, you know, I went and said, well, I don't really want to go to college. So I dropped out. I mean, to be honest, I got thrown <laughs> out of college. And I, I started a bookstore and they, they didn't like it because I put the other bookstore out of business. Yeah, and so I just, oh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> they're like, um, you have to either shut it down or we're going to kick you out. And I said, yeah, but everybody's happy. And they're like, yeah, but our bookstore is going bankrupt. And I said, well, that's their problem. They're overcharging. <laughs> so, so I just went out and, and when I, when I left that, I realized I'm not supposed to be doing what conventional wisdom says. And so I, I went out and started selling some insurance and said, wait, there's way more money in real estate. So let me do some real estate. And after I read one of Kiyosaki's books, his, his second one, Rich Dad, Poor Dad was his second one. Uh, the, the first one is if you want to be rich and happy, don't go to school. So I was like, oh, wow. yeah, that's my book. <laughs> so, so I read that and, and went out and started buying some real estate. And, and what that turned into was pr a pretty crazy business over the next five, six years with 150 houses, developments, apartments. And I was the smartest man on the planet called SMOP. <laughs> and when, when I got to that point, my ego took over and I said, well, I'm invincible, 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And at that point, the market collapsed and I went with it. And so my, my balance sheet went from positive 5 million to negative 5 million in wow. a matter of months. And the biggest problem with that was not losing the money. It was that my entire identity was the money. So my self-worth and net worth were all tangled together. And so the losing all the money, a $20 million portfolio, the Ferrari that Will Smith drove around in Bad Boys 2, like I was the man until I was oh, nothing. Wow. And that changed everything. And I had to sit back, take a time out and say, okay, what, who am I? What am I all about? And what I realized is that I'm a teacher 
and I'm not just a teacher that studied some crap in school that I'm going to regurgitate and vomit on you. I literally have been out there and, and done it. And so teaching from experience, I have an, em an emotional intelligence because my DNA has been rewired from the experience of trauma. And that's, that's what I, I bring to the equation, the, the table when with the different businesses I have, they're all teaching, whether it's retirement accounts or precious metals or financial literacy. It's right. teaching from the experience. That's, that's what I am today is, is a teacher based on experience. So you, could, you would call me a mentor, if anything, because I've been through this crap that, that people are looking to get help with. Yeah, so this is perfect time. So um, based on what, what's been going on in, in, in the market in the past um, couple of weeks, is that like deja vu for you? Or you know, what, do you what is your take on it? Yeah, you know, it's actually, in a weird way, it's very exciting because the first time you go through hell, you're like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world and, and it hurts and you're scared. And then the second time you're like, oh, it's, it's the sequel. Like I've already seen this, uh, this movie is like, uh, you know, hell, the remember sequel. It. Yeah, it's like hell two. You're like, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to see hell three and four and five in my lifetime. And, and one of the great things is like, I start seeing things, for example, in precious metals, when you see market manipulation. The first time, it just looks like really weird. And the second time, which is what we're seeing right now, I see the same thing I saw in 2008 and I go, right. oh, I remember this. And because I had so much money involved, money is a great way to get emotional because money is emotional yes. and we tie to the energy of it. And so there's a memory, a muscle memory. It's an emotional muscle memory from that experience. And now I'm watching these things and I'm going, oh yeah, I tingle. And so it's, it's an emotional understanding of, of how everything is working. And so when people go, well, I don't know what to do next. Like, what, what do I do? And I'm like, okay, well, I know where you're going because I can <laughs> sense it. It's a weird sense when you go through it. This market is going to crash and it's going to be a phoenix where it'll come back from the ashes. It's a cycle. And right now there's chaos because most people are just running like, they're just running from their glands. They're like a bunch of zombies uh, that are over caffeinated, too many five hour energy drinks. <laughs> like it's, it's really kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> well so i, I guess uh, you know with with you being uh, the best selling author of uh, several financial books your experience through the first uh, downturn that was experienced uh, a while back you have a very deep understanding of the financial system as you were just mentioning so what, what are your thoughts on the current state of the market well, here's the reality. We're in an asset bubble of everything. We have been. This bull market that's been going on for a decade has been artificially inflated based on tons and tons of printing from the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and all the banks around the world. And they've been trying to keep everything up because they don't. politicians want to stay in office. Let's just be honest. Everybody yeah. wants to keep everything yeah. going because very, very wealthy people and politicians maintain status quo if everybody's like fat, dumb, and happy and entertained. <laughs> And mm -hmm. so that's what a lot of cash pushed into the system. It makes everybody feel wealthy because of the wealth factor. If the stock market's up, people feel wealthier. If the stock yeah. market drops, that's the, the roller coaster. When you see the green arrow, you're like, yay, it's good. Let's go out to dinner. If you see the red arrow, you're like, screw it. We're having rice and beans. And, <laughs> and, and you're like hunkering down, staring at CNBC. And people are like, it's okay. Everything's going to be fine. Jim Cramer's telling you to buy more, you know? And, bye, bye, bye. And, and, it, yeah, exactly. Like he's hitting that damn button on his, on his crazy show. Freaking madness. So, you know, that, that's, that's what we're, I mean, that's what I'm seeing in, in this market is, is kind of just a lot of, there's a lot of fear and fear makes people stupid because emotions go up and intellect goes right down. You know, that, that reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. It's, uh, the more you know, the less you fear. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people are, the uncertainty in that fear is kind of driving a lot of decision-making, whether it's coronavirus or the stock market. Well, and you can also look, the, the further you look back, the further you can see forward is a great quote. It's a great, it's a great way to think. We don't tend to look backwards. We, one of the things I, one of the problems I have with, quite honestly, most millennials is they have no clue about reality. Their reality is that every time everything hap anything happens, they're a winner. And they don't understand pain because they've never been through it. And, and they don't look backwards. They're definitely the worst stewards of, of history. Like they're, they don't study it. And if you study it, you look back and you're like, okay, well, hey, things have been a lot worse. There's been the Spanish flu. There's been the, the depression. And we will go through hard times. And guess what? We'll get through them. Like it's hmm. even, the, even when you talk about the coronavirus and, and you, people die. Yeah, you know what? 40,000 people die. You're driving their cars. And we don't sit in our driveway <laughs> afraid. I mean, come on. Like give me a break. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is definitely a busy concern, right? So uh, with, with the uncertainty in the, in the stock market and uh, a lot of folks, that's where a lot of the wealth is, one, generated and also um, stored as well, right? What are your recommendations to those folks who have all their money in, in, in the current stock market? Well, this, this is a good time to, to get really present with what the heck are you invested in? And most people don't have a clue. So at, at the, to start, it's really asking, okay, what are you invested in and why? And right. most people say, well, it's a mutual fund. And they go, well, yeah. And then that's it. Like that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> they don't have any idea what companies, they don't know if the companies are good or bad or if they're doing anything that matters or if they're just borrowing a bunch of money and they're a fat pig ready to slaughter. Like they don't know. <laughs> so the first thing is getting clear because clarity is where the power starts. And so you get clear on your stuff and you say, okay, if you, if you think you're in a mutual fund and you're diversified, you're like, no, 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 I got three mutual funds. I'm super diversified. I'm like, no, you're not. You're in one asset class. You're in paper and paper is manipulated and paper is set up to feed the beast. The beast is Wall Street. It's, it's that system. So the question is, what else can you or should you be invested in? And, and that's where like the hard stuff where it's real estate, multifamily, precious metals. I'm a big fan of real estate and metals, hard things that you can touch because it's really hard to manipulate an apartment building. I mean, you can paint <laughs> it, but okay, that's good. That's a good manipulation for you. And then metals I love because there's no counterparty risk. There's nobody that can screw up an interest rate and make your asset worth less. <laughs> like it's still the same ounce of gold right in front of you. So I, I think it, it causes us to ask, what is asset allocation? What does that even mean? And what are we actually invested in? I mean, that's, that's the benefit of this right now. When things are falling, we go, oh my gosh, I'm getting poorer. You might just be getting smarter because you're being forced to look at it. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I like that. That's super, super impressive. Super impressive. Uh, so um, I guess uh, most of the retirement accounts are in the stock market and mutual funds and things like that. So um, as far as maybe taking what you have in your retirement accounts from kind of the volatility of the market and putting it into something else, precious metals or real estate. Uh, what are the mechanisms that you have for that? And, and, and this may be a silly question, but what's the difference between a QRP and then an EQRP? Uh, is what, what, what makes it enhanced? So, so basically there are options with re retirement accounts. As you said, most people by default, they have a 401k and that's where most people start. They start with a 401k, 457, 403b. These are all different types of qualified plans. A, a TSP, Thrift Savings Plan, it's a federal government thing. These are all QRPs. Qualified retirement plan just means it's a tax shelter. It's part of the tax code that says there are tax benefits. So an EQRP, the Enhanced Qualified Retirement Plan, is a unique thing that only we do that allows you to have control of your retirement money in a checkbook where your money is protected from liability, from vultures. I mean, there are people that are already suing Princess for the coronavirus. So if you don't think you're going to get oh. sued and you're, you know, at some point, then you're crazy if you're in America. Like this is the land of opportunity and lawsuits. So, or maybe it's lawsuits from opportunity from lawsuits. I don't know. Anyways, the, the point is that there's options to be able to have control of it. And the EQRP gives you that power to be able to invest. All sorts of retirements give you retirement accounts. These QRPs, qualified plans, do give you access to tax benefits, but they don't give you control and they don't give you protection. And a lot of people get stuck because they have employees. So they're like, well, I don't really have any options. I have to have a 401k with stocks. And I'm like, no, you don't. An EQRP allows you to have employees and buy things like real estate, buy precious metals, buy loans, almost anything you can think of, you can have inside of a retirement account. And in fact, there's ways to do it where you're, it's tax free forever, not just growing tax free, but distributing, pulling the money out tax free because there's a Roth EQRP. So, okay. I mean, really what, what this comes down to is paying taxes is a choice. You guys remember when, <laughs> when our president famously was debating Hillary and, and she said, he doesn't pay taxes. That's why he doesn't want to do his return and show it. And he's like, that's because I'm smart. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I remember right? watching that very yeah. specifically. No, it's, and I, and my friends, they play that clip when they do presentations and it cracks me up and I'm like, yeah, you know what? The tax code is set up. Anybody listening to this can change their tax rate. If you change your facts, you can change your tax. That's what Tom Wheelwright says. Great, <laughs> great quote. And that, I mean, it's the tax code is there. It's not like, ooh, it's in a black box. You can't get to it. You literally just have to say, okay, I'm going to use it. And one of the things that people do is they, they play tax advisor or they, you know, they, like they do their own taxes and they go, I can do this. 
my dad used to do his tax uh, tax reform tax forms his returns with a pencil and i was like dad why don't you have an account and he's like oh i got this and i'm like well that's pretty stupid when i looked at it in retrospect but people just they, they're like they're cheap and when you're cheap <laughs> you're going to get dumb advice because it's the advice in your head and how much do you know about taxes i i teach a lot of accountants about retirement stuff because it's a nuanced part of the tax code. There's like 70,000 pages of tax code. Nobody knows all of that. <laughs> Nobody. Like, I don't care who you are. And, <laughs> and so you gotta have a team around this stuff. And the reason you have a team is because they're gonna, you're gonna spend way less on them than you are on taxes. And it's just, I mean, that's just math. Like, so the reason that people, that businesses go and spend millions of dollars with lobbyists in Washington, DC is because they get billions of dollars in subsidies. It's a pretty good return. Like JP, uh, J, J. Paul Getty talked about this best return you're ever going to make is in political influence. And wow. the sec and what that results in is a lot of tax benefits that you get written for you. So just think about that. This tax code is written by the wealthy. Why not use it for yourself? It's there. Yeah. I've, 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 it's one of something else I've heard that I've really glommed onto myself uh, because I was the same way I've, growing up in my stages, I've always sort of taken it one chunk at a time. And uh, I was always like, oh, I'll learn taxes one day. You know, I, I, I turbo tax, I just fill in boxes, you know, and it's easy. And then it got to the point where it's like, now I have the family, I have kids, I, I need to be a little bit more wise with where the money's being taxed, how it's being taxed, what I'm paying in taxes, how I could reduce that so that we, I could provide, better provide for, for my family. So, um, yeah, I, I completely agree. The, the, and there's just to be clear, this is not, hey, I'm just going to hire people and abdicate responsibility. There's a big difference between delegating and abdicating. And a lot of people, yeah. if anything, they <laughs> abdicate and they go, it's, it's like having a financial advisor or somebody where you say, well, I'm not, I don't know. I'm just going to hand my money to them. And then they decide it's their money. I mean, if you ever, we run into this all the time, advisors and custodians, they're like, well, no, you're too stupid. Don't take this money. You can't take this money because you're too stupid. <laughs> and, and this is the attitude of the industry. And so what you have to do is you have to say, okay, first off, it's my damn money and I'm going to take responsibility for it. No, it's not yours. And I'm going to take total responsibility for it. So I'm going to learn about it. And it doesn't mean you're going to become an expert in taxes. It means you do things like read Tom Wheelwright's book, Tax-Free yeah, Wealth. Tax -free. Mm -hmm. super smart book. He's like, the guy's brilliant. And it doesn't take that long. You spend a few hours reading this book and now you have something to talk about with your freaking accountant. Otherwise you're like, I don't know. I mean, that's the end of your contribution. I don't know. <laughs> so at least start with something and then have a team. And then that's, that's really what everybody needs to be doing. Not becoming a tax attorney or an accountant, but get the basic language and a, a, a core understanding so that you're not just, otherwise you're, the number is 70%. You guys, that's the number that we're going to give away in our lifetime to the government's taxes, oh, wow. Wow. 70% or zero if you play a different game. And it is a game. I mean, let's be honest. It's just a big game. It's like Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game. Play the game, understand how the rules work, and then you can start applying it to your life. Right. And so for the, the, the EQRP, is that something that people can just go out and find custodians for, or is that something that you specialize in? Yeah, good question. The EQRP is where you get to be the own, your own custodian. So basically, a custodian and a trustee are one and the same. So the person that is in charge gets to be you, which is a totally different experience. Any IRA that most, most people, if they have some type of control, have an IRA, self-directed IRA, very common. Yeah. Problem is there's a custodian, and that custodian's a big pain in the butt. And even if they're not a pain in the butt, they're going to be a pain in the butt. Like it's PIA is their system. And so you just have to say, okay, well, do I want to have somebody else in control and a pain in my butt forever? Or do I want to be in control? <laughs> EQRP lets you be the driver. You're not in the damn trunk of your car. Like you're in the driver's seat and you, you decide where it goes. You put the assets in the car. Uh, at best, if you have a custodian or if you have a financial advisor, you might be in the back seat, but you're likely in the trunk in the dark. So just think of it that way. Like, do you want to drive or do you want to be in the dark, bouncing around, wondering what's going on? Because you're going off a cliff if you're in the back, if you're in the trunk, which is how it so is. If I, so say I, I have my 401k or say I had one with a previous company that now isn't being contributed to, or I have a Roth IRA with uh, a financial advisor who's the custodian. How, how does it work? Do I just walk into his office and say, cash me out, I'm putting it all in an EQRP? And he's like, oh, okay, we'll cut you a check and then you get your check. How do you facilitate the EQRP portion of 
that transaction, I guess? The answer is yes. Yes, Heath, the answer is yes, and he's going to kick and scream. I mean, bottom line is yeah. yes. I mean, you're, that, that's the basic fundamentals. When, once, once we set up an EQRP, we set up an account. You have, there's a checking account that is part of that, that trust. Basically, you're going to have the ability to tell your advisor, hey, cut me, get, cut me a check, get me out of the market, whatever you want to do. Give me a check that you deposit, and then now you have the checkbook control. And so, I mean, it really is that simple. What, wow. what happens, I mean, we talked we talk to a, an advisor yesterday and the, the level of arrogance and condensation, yeah. like they were so oh, yeah. condescending towards the client. Well, why, why would you want to do this? I don't know. I mean, that's, you know, it was just this level of <laughs> holier than thou that, I, you know, I'm much smarter. I'm like, you just sell a bunch of crap. I mean, oh, yeah, your yeah. crap is showing up right now in the markets. It's called bloody everywhere. <laughs> I see that. And, but, you know, people that the whole system is set up to keep the money trapped because of AUM, assets under management. It's the fees that that's why they say just hold on for the long term. Why? Because you <laughs> yeah. are their retirement plan. Like that's they're right. going to yeah. get fees from you forever so they can golf and have vacations and hang out. Like, you know, a financial advisor right now that's at home has fees coming in. So even though everybody else is going to be off work, quarantined, Hey, advisory is a great place to be because you keep getting fees. You're not doing anything. You're just getting fees. Markets are going down, fees. Markets go up, fees. It's just fees, 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 fees. <laughs> like that's a great model for them, not for you. Coming from someone who uh, ca I cashed out my Roth IRA, it was, you know, it was something that we had just, my wife and I, both of ours, we were contributing a little bit over the time of our first uh, seven years of our, our marriage. And then we got interested in real estate. So I went and completely cashed it out and I didn't have to pay any taxes on it just simply because it was, we took it out at a loss. There was no, it wasn't making any money. And it's because every year when we'd go meet with our financial planner, we're like, all right, how's everything going? Cause you know, it's all matrix code to me. I, I have to say that I'm a little uninformed when it comes to mutual. I was one of the people who was just like, Oh, it's in mutual funds. I got a bunch of them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, anytime they're like, Oh, well we should, vary your risk ratios and this, that, and the other. And then there's like some $1,500 charge for replacing everything. And so it was the same thing. I went in there and I'm like, hey, no, cut me a check. I'm done. I'm done playing this Roth IRA game. Uh, as of right now, I want to start buying real estate and the condescension, the stick around for the long term. And I, I, it was a 30 minute conversation of me convincing him. No, no, I understand what you're telling me. Cut me my check. <laughs> It's almost, it's almost as hard to get out of there as it is getting out of a timeshare presentation. I mean, it's <laughs> right. yeah. I love you know, it. So like, I love they will it. let you go. They're like, no, 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 but we need to have somebody else with bigger boobs come and talk to you because maybe they'll convince you. <laughs> yeah. You're like, man, I just give me my check. Like, and, and get, unlock the door. Like, they'll lock you down. And you're like, I've had people that literally spent months and then they go, they, they just won't give it to me. And, I, and you're like, what happened? Well, I just gave up. I'm like, come <laughs> on, but it's that's what they do. And then they, they punch you around and you know, somebody gets worn out. So they give you somebody else. Well, there's only one you, so you just get worn out and they will literally drag you. We've had people that we were transferring, helping them transfer funds and like with E-Trade and, and Edward Jones, Edward Jones is probably the worst. And I say it because that's my opinion. I, and you know what, this isn't slander. This is my damn experience being on the phone, <laughs> waiting for two hours, literally two hours client wasn't on the phone. We were on the phone waiting, sitting there, twiddling our thumbs because they put you on hold in a queue and just hope that you'll go away. And then sometimes wow. they'll just hang up on you. <laughs> Two hours we sat there and they finally got on the phone. We're like, yeah, give us the damn check. And like, <laughs> it, it's like, you, we're not going away. But that's the, that's the system. And like, it's really interesting. You mentioned pulling your money out of your Roth IRA and, and not having any taxes. People don't realize like in a Roth account, you can pull out all the money you put in as long as it's at your basis, which is the amount you put in or less, tax-free, penalty-free any day. And yeah, can, absolutely. You, I mean, it's, the Roth is one of the coolest secret weapons in finance that exists. And most people are like, what? A, a root, root Roth? Wow. <laughs> so it's, Roth really can, it's, it's one of those tools that was set up. Interesting fact, in the 90s when this came into play, um, it was under, there's a guy named William Roth, the, the senator from Delaware, and they put this thing in and all of a sudden, guess what? Congress had a surplus of taxable money. They're like, oh, we're so smart. I'm like, you're not smart. You guys just kicked the can. Here's what happened. When everybody converted money from deferred, like normal 401ks and IRAs to Roth, all that money became taxable when they converted it. So all wow. this new tax revenue came in and everybody thought they were smart. So they had budget surpluses in the 90s and they said, oh, good. No, not good. Because all that money now was never going to be taxed again. 
instead of those 401ks growing over the next 20, 30 years and then being taxed in 2020 and 2030, there's no tax coming in right now. It's 2020. There's no tax revenue coming in. So they screwed everybody in the future so that they could say, we're brilliant today. That's why we had a tax, we, we, why we had a surplus in the 90s. It was because of the freaking Roth. So just understand, Congress is not your friend. The opposite of what the, the bill says is what's happening. So if it says the Secure Act, it's the Insecurity Act. Like that's what happens. <laughs> oh wow, I love it. Yeah. I love so it. this this EQRP, yeah, it sounds like a pretty new thing, right? Yes, yeah, so the EQRP is 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 a package that around a concept that's been around for forty seven years. Forty seven years. That's, that that doesn't sound very new. It's not new. People go, I've never heard of this. It's brand new, and I'm like, yeah, it's not brand new. I mean, basically, the tax code is sitting there. ERISA back in the early seventies was formed formed 401ks and IRAs. And then they basically just sat there and people kept putting mutual funds into them. And over the years, it's evolved. And what we did is, is over the last 10 years, we, we formed the EQRP into a form that could, people get, could actually use for things other than stocks, bonds, right. mutual funds, you know, all that junk. So it's, it's new-ish if you talk about, you know, tens of thousands of people that have been doing it for a decade. I guess it's new. <laughs> got you got you so been around for what 46 years uh, almost 50 years yeah, almost that, 50 that, years that, that is crazy um so what, what is the, are you are you the only company doing e eqrp we yeah because eqrp is what it's it's our dna it's it's a okay. patented uh, trademarked process and unique everything about it is unique so lots of people say well we have the same thing and no you don't i mean a firm that has a self directed IRA is not an EQRP. A, people, gotcha. a firm that's a solo 401k provider, that's a generic thing. That is not unique. There's a solo 401k is the same across the board. An EQRP is unique. And it, there's only one company that does it, the EQRP company. I mean, how, how simpler <laughs> does it get? You know, <laughs> right? And, and you wrote the book. <laughs> and, and, I, and I wrote the book. And there's a lot of great books. There, there are better books on retirement stuff than mine. I mean, I can, I can scroll off. The difference is mine's actually readable. Like you can buzz through it. And it was, it was written. It's like Kiyosaki and I talk about this when we're, we're teaching and stuff. And he'll say, look, I'm a best selling author. I'm not a best writing author. There are smarter people by far than me in this space. But he, he wrote it and that was the goal to make a book that people could actually read and they would do something with. I don't care about being the smartest guy. I am not the smartest guy. There are other attorneys and accountants out there and professionals that are much smarter and have way more technical books that nobody will ever read. Like that is good for them and they can pat themselves on their backs in their, you know, their continuing education course when they go, look at my new fancy technical book. That is not <laughs> what I was doing. The QRP book is for people to read and actually do something and take, take control and, and have freedom in their life. Got you. So we, we talk about several different terms. We talk about the IRA, the self-directed IRA and the EQRP. What makes the EQRP a more, uh, more preferred um, form of investments? The EQRP gives you actual control and it protects your assets from getting sued and, and losing them. It allows you, so not only do you have a checkbook with your money, you're protected in case some knucklehead decides to trip over the, their own shoes right. and, and sue you because they happen to be 50 feet from your house or you run into them, you drive over their dog or something. And the other thing too is as, as you're growing, whether you have full-time or part-time employees, the, an EQRP adapts for that. And no other plan does that. It doesn't work. Like any other plan, say for a solo 401k, does not work with an employee, even a part-time employee. It doesn't work. It blows up. An IRA, you don't have control. And here's the deal. If you're doing real estate, you're going to get screwed because of UBIT tax. We haven't even that's, talked about that. That's, that's, like, that's, that, that was actually one of my next questions is that uh, reading the book and, and, and hearing you speak, there's you bring up the UBIT tax a lot. And so I was going to have you dive into what that is for our listeners. Yeah, so the UBIT tax is unrelated business income tax. And basically what this is, there, Congress years ago said, hey, if you're going to use a tax shelter to, to go buy things with leverage or an active business, we're going to charge you a tax because it's not fair that you're going out there and, and operating, doing things where you're not paying taxes and Jimmy Joe next door with Jimmy John sandwich shop is paying taxes. We don't like that. So they tried to level the playing field. The problem is in 1980, that developers came in and they said, um, well, actually, we need a lot of money from the pensions and these 401ks, and so we don't want them getting screwed, so they changed the code, so there's an exemption. Basically, the EQRP 401ks can invest in real estate that has debt, and they don't have this tax, this UBIT tax, whereas the IRAs got left holding the bag, and they do pay the tax. So the IRAs are going to pay 37% tax oh, wow. on, on these profits. It's brutal. 
Wow. Yeah, so w- when I first got in, got into real estate, um, I went to a big conference, and one of the biggest things they talk about was how you can move your money over to a solo 401k. I, I was intrigued by that. So um, learning about QRP is definitely a change in my not a change in my paradigm, and it, it's absolutely beneficial. But being that it's so, um, it, it's such a preferred way of uh, moving your money or controlling your retirement funds. It should be pretty expensive, right? It, it, it is expensive if you don't do it because you're going to pay a bunch of taxes. So that's, <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean it, it's, it's funny because I, I hear people and, and sometimes the funniest one is there's this goofy company that has an app and they're trying to tell people, hey, we can have your retirement stuff done with an app. And I was like, great. If you want to have an advisor that's a bot, then by all means, go there. I mean, it, it's the adage that you get what you pay for. And um, the most expensive advice is the free advice. And, and not buying something, guess what? You're going to spend 70% of your money on taxes. So when you, when you go and you decide what you're going to do, I have people go, well, I had somebody talk to me and they said, well, I want, to, I want to set up an LLC. And I said, okay. And they said, what do you think I should do? And I said, well, honestly, if I'm going to have somebody set it up and you're starting out, I'd have a guy named Garrett Sutton. Have him, he's an asset protection guy. He's one of the rich dad advisors. I happen to know him. I teach with him. And, and he's a smart guy. And this is what he does. It's like us. All we do is the EQRP. So he's a specialist and, and he charges, you know, 700, 800, 900 bucks for an, an LLC. And she goes, well, you know, I went, I went online and I can get it cheaper. I'm like, I know you can. <laughs> it's like 150, 200 bucks. I was like, so you're going to get what you pay for. And mm-hmm. so if that's what you want, if you want to be the attorney, go for it. Like, and there's legal zoom and there's all these things. Yeah. It's just a question of, do you want to do everything yourself? Because who are you an investor or are you a pretend attorney? And people forget which hat they're supposed to be wearing. You're the investor. Hello, do not do everything. You're not wearing 15 hats. Like that's the dumbest thing that you can do as an investor because you're going you're gonna to make mistakes. You want a team. I mean, investing in business is a team sport. If you don't get this, hear it. It's a team sport. Your job is to be the dumbest one there with a lot of smart people around you. I mean, if you're the smartest one there, you're in trouble. I did that. It's called you're losing your ass. Like it's, it's going it, you know, to it's gonna, it's, it's gonna happen because you can't know everything and you're in an echo chamber. It's like being on a Facebook feed. Whatever you search for is what you see and you don't see anything outside of that. It's like, oh, I must be right. right. You're not right. You're in a freaking echo chamber. And that's the same thing if you don't have professionals. So depending on what you want to do, if you want an EQRP, yeah, you're, you're going to write a check for it that is going to be about the most valuable money you'll ever spend because you're going to have a team and you're going to have the best thing out there, the best tool. So you're going to be driving a Rolls Royce around that's armor plated. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I like that. <laughs> armor plated Rolls So I, I had a quick question. So you, you mentioned TSPs earlier. So if you're military like Hutch or a federal employee like me, we have our TSPs, uh, which is a thrift savings plan. Uh, are you able to move that TSP into EQRP? And if so, how does that work? Like how does continual contributions to the TSP and the matching that the government do, uh, the, the match that the government does, how does that factor into being, does it all get moved or do you just move one chunk at a time? What, what are the intricacies of turning a TSP into an EQRP? So the, the thrift savings plan, if you're a federal employee, uh, you've got two options. One, it's going to be there until you leave or two, quit or get fired. And once, once you're out of there, you're going to be able to move your money over all of it into an EQRP. While you're there, basically that's on lockup. And gotcha. m- most 401ks and f- 457s are the same. There's something called an in-kind rollover. Some employers will allow you to move over part of your plan while you're still working. It's called the in-service rollover. Yeah. That is fairly rare. It's maybe 1 in 10 to 1 in 20 that actually allow it. Okay. So what, what's interesting, guys, is that there are plenty of people that are looking and are saying, well, I've got 10 years left. And I look at their stuff and I go, if you left today and you use some of these strategies, you could take the money you have, take control of it, start living off of it, and you could literally quit tomorrow. So they go, wait a second. So if I just took, I don't need to wait 10 years. So if you have the right people around, again, Google doesn't tell you this. Google doesn't, people do. (laughs) People that are strategists. You could literally, I mean, I've had people that quit five and 10 years early because they didn't even realize what resources were sitting there and they didn't have a plan for them. They're like, well, I got it. I got a million bucks in my retirement account, but I got 10 more years because I'm only 50. I was like, yeah, but what if you convert that money? You leave, you convert it to Roth and guess what? You are now free for the rest of your life with some financial education. And they went, holy mackerel. I just, I just bought 10 years of my life. 
I mean, I talk about this where the people came in and they had an IRA and and we converted their IRA to an EQRP and, and it saved them $20,000 in tax from UBIT. It was like a 15 wow. minute call, which is better than Geico. And <laughs> But this 15 minute call could save you 10 years of your life. I mean, how much is that worth that's to buy 10 years? That's priceless. <laughs> priceless. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's your life. So just, you know, you think about that. People go, well, yeah, but Google says that I can do this on my own. I'm like, all right. So good luck. I hope you get those 10 years. What in the <laughs> world is wrong with you? Like that's, we, we need to think about our priorities and, and what we're spending money on and how, how arrogant we're being. I, my problem back in the late 2000s was my ego was driving that ship off a cliff and it was because of the arrogance. I thought I was the smartest person. I was the, old, I was the smartest person. Big problem, not that smart. And so being the smartest person around, I didn't hear anybody tell me, look, you're dumb. I just said, oh, I know all the answers. I did not have all the answers. That's why I lost all that money. I didn't know what I didn't know. And nobody was there to say, hey, dumb, dumb. Look in the mirror. You're an idiot. And, and maybe... <laughs> Look at this. And, and if we don't have that, you know, nobody needs to berate you or belittle you. Right. But sometimes they do. Sometimes they need to just slap the crap out of you and, and give you a clue. And, and I think that's the thing that people need. They need a dose of reality. It's like right now we're getting a dose of reality of what an asset bubble looks like. Yeah. Because when things come down, they come down really fast. The bigger they get puffed up. I mean, really fast. And when you see the Dow drop 2,000 points in a Oof. day, and they, I mean, this is happening day after day. It's because it's been puffed up so much and people go, well, that's crazy. It shouldn't happen. Make it stop. Make it stop. And, they, and they'd say, Fed, please print money. And they print money and the, this bleeding stops for like five minutes. It's because this thing is so puffed up and most of our lives are so puffed up because of the arrogance and ego and, and we're just not willing to be adults. It's like toddlers running the show. It's crazy. <laughs> so definitely take time to educate yourself, especially about your financial future. That's the best investment yeah. you're ever going to make, guys. Yeah. I mean, we all know this. Uh, well, okay, let me say this. A few of us know this. Most of the people in the population don't know this. When people ask me, what should I invest in? I say you. And they say, what does that mean? I'm like, <laughs> go, go, go to a seminar, read a book, join a meetup, start a meetup, do, get a mentor, find somebody, invest in yourself, invest in the right team members. One of the reasons that you buy advice from very smart people that are specialists is because you're investing in your own education. If you go to Google, good luck. Because you're not investing in anything except chaos. And it'll tell you whatever you want to hear. It's unbelievable. I read, I'm like, there's an attorney telling people that this is it. And I'm like, that, but that's the opposite of truth. Like he's literally saying the opposite of the tax code. So Google will tell you whatever you want it to tell you. I mean, just right. think about that for a second. It doesn't tell you the truth. It tells you whatever you want to hear. That's scary. So, yeah, so uh, this, if you want to get general, truth bombs right there. <laughs> if you want to get general so, information, talk, um, go see Google. If you want to get specific information about your future, um, speak to a specialist. Yeah, and if you want yeah. the truth. I mean, I, I, Google will give you specific information that will take right. you off a cliff. It will be like, oh, yeah, do mm -hmm. this. And you're like, because you, when you ask on Google, you type, how do I do this? And then it says some idiot that wrote an article about how to do this <laughs> that just regurgitated information off of some other blog on Google. And you're like, oh, well, that's a fancy, pretty, snappy little website. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to that one. That people don't even know. And then there's like, then they make up pen names. You're like, well, who is this? It's, it's Fred Savage. It, it, dude, the wonder oh, years are not on Google. Okay. I mean, come on. Like, <laughs> like, let's be honest about what we're actually looking at and, and yeah. who the sources are. And what, like when I wrote the QRP book, go, if you go look at it, 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 the original draft was done by a tax attorney and I, everything, every word in that book is vetted and verified. And there's footnotes with the IRS. Why? Because I don't want somebody to go, well, prove it. I'm like, just read the freaking footnote. Like <laughs> the IRS, like, you know, call the IRS. That's what the IRS said. Well, how, how do you know? I'm like, because I read the tax code and because that's what it says. Well, are you sure? And I'm like, I'm as sure as the IRS prints. So, <laughs> yes. you know, just, just think about the source. I think that that's like when we're listening to the news, we, we listen to a lot of people and their conjecture and their opinions. And, and they, these are opinions. What are, what are the facts? The facts are what we need to pay attention to. Yeah. So uh, when we're talking about educating, so say I, you know, like my dad and my granddad who both have 401k and, you know, currently my, my granddad's long retired and, you know, taking his draws from his 401k in retirement as the normal path goes. Uh, but I want them to start buying more real estate. Uh, how should I go about educating them about the benefits of moving 
to an EQRP? Or what would you say to someone who feels it's safer to keep their money in a 401k and not take control of it? I would say that they're smoking crack. Um, <laughs> Grandparents I mean, smoke crack. <laughs> I, I just, I wouldn't be. Dad, put down the crack pipe, get your 401k check, and come do an EQRP. <laughs> That'll go over like a lead balloon. Um, know, right? Especially yeah. with my dad. My dad's old school. <laughs> I mean, this is what people will do. They'll go, well, that's 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 crazy. That's terrifying. I remember talking to my dad before he passed away and he, he would say, when are you going back to college? And I'd be like, dad, why would I do that? And he's like, well, that's where the security is. That's where your pension is. I'm like, dad, I got 150 houses. He's like, I don't really understand what you're doing. But when are you going back to college? I'm like, <laughs> dad, I've got a pension. It's called a bunch of doors. And, um, and granted I blew it all up and I lost, you know, that, that portfolio, but I didn't lose the experience. And what he never had was the experience and any wisdom. He just had a lot of information about what he thought the stock market was going to do for him. And so educating people is two things. One, it's bite-sized nuggets Two, it's modeling. So one of the best things that any of us can do is do something and then people will watch us. Like I have a, a good buddy now that when we, we met, well, we actually met years earlier, but when we finally had a conversation, he goes, I've been watching you for years and I just really like what you're doing and I like who you are. And I just, I watch how you show up. I was like, so you've been stalking me? And he goes, <laughs> yeah, kind of. And I was like, that's cool, man. That's really cool. He's like, yeah, you know, I just, I just pay attention. Like, I don't, I don't really care what you say. I care what you do. And I watch what you're doing. And that's what people, parents, grandparents, people we right. love, they're watching, you know, they're paying attention. And look, the ones that don't, that are just like ignoring you or not talking to you, don't want it. You can't, you can't teach pigs to sing. So <laughs> I, I'm not calling your parents pigs. I'm saying that sure. the, the truth is if people want to waddle in the mud, you, you don't, don't mess with them. Like just keep doing your thing. Eventually they get bored to look over and like, what are you doing? Oh, you're doing this real estate thing and let them naturally do it. People don't like to be forced. They don't like to be told what to do. Like think about it as a kid. Yeah. What do you tell your parents? Stop telling me what to do. You know, like that makes you crazy. Parents do not like their kids and grandkids telling them what to do. What you can be is a fine example of, of success and, and tenacity and going through it and sharing things. Like the QRP is great. You kind of just leave this everywhere you go. You know how like when you go to the bathroom in a, in a public place, like a restaurant, and like people stick business cards different places. You're like, dude, seriously, at the urinal? Like, why is there a business? I'm like, what am I gonna do? Oh yeah, I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna call John right now. I need a consultation. Like, give me a break. That's a terrible idea. But leaving books around for whatever you're interested in, sometimes you'd be surprised. People will just say, hey, I, I picked up that book, or like I have a report I'll give everybody that's a 14 page report, and you can get the essence of what we've been talking about and. It doesn't take that long, 15 minutes. Another 15 minute deal that's better than Geico. You know, like it's, <laughs> that, that's how I would approach it. Do good by doing something so you're a model and then share information gently because nobody wants to have anything crammed down their throat. Yeah, it's perfect that you brought it up because I do the same thing with Athena. I do believe that it's really important that in a marriage that you are supposed to grow together but we don't always make the same choices of um, podcasts to listen to, videos to watch, books to read, so on and so forth, right? You know, so it's important to me that we grow together. So I listen to things without my headphones sometimes just loud enough for her to hear it and spark that interest, right? And then we can That's eventually talk, talk about it, you know? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's pretty cool that you talk about, you know, planting those, those seeds for future, you know, for future growth. It's yeah. osmosis, yeah. just having it around. It's I like, okay, <laughs> what, so years ago I had, um, I had a book, I did my first book, which is if you want to see the worst cover book cover in the history of publishing, it's right. called Maverick Mistakes in Real Estate Investing. I think it's like one star. I don't think anybody actually read it. I think they just looked at the cover like this is the worst book ever. And I'm going to tell you why, because it's terrible because some idiot put used PowerPoint to design a cover, which I did. And <laughs> I, I got this book. I was so proud of it. Got my like 2000 copies shipped over from China and I, they all showed up. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm so proud. So I took it and I put all the books on the bookshelf in the living room, got rid of all the other books. And you know how long that lasted? Uh, when my significant other got home, she's like, yeah, no, no, no. You know, you don't get to put a thousand books on the, on the wall. Get rid of the books. Like I was like, oh, but you haven't read it yet. She's like, I get it out, get it out. You can have one book. Oh, like, damn. So gently guys, like if you're going to help people uh, over, over noise your headphones and somebody's like, oh, what are you listening to? That's a good idea. Putting a thousand books of the same book in your living room, bad idea. <laughs> <Got you. laughs> yeah. oh, man. man, um, it's always really great to, to, to listen to you speak. And uh, actually, we're honored to actually have the interview 
with you because your thought process is, is very unique, right? It's not always business. You're always adding value to, to, um, to people outside of just preaching EQRP, EQRP. You want to see people grow um, on a several different levels. You know, um, I had the luxury of, uh, I'm going to be super honest with you. I didn't, I didn't watch all of it, but um, a decade by design. That was a beautiful video that you, that you presented um, with helping people, people to grow, right? I actually pulled, I was still pulled up on my website to, to finish watching it. But it's, it's beautiful the, the way you think about things and the way you give back um, to, to people um, to making their life better. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that. It's yeah. kind of funny because I think about the last however many minutes we've been talking and, and it, it feels like the EQRP almost had to be pulled out. Like we had to like <laughs> get forced into the conversation because, you know, it's, when, it's really obvious when I listen to a lot of podcasts and, and things and you can tell when somebody is sitting there trying to pitch you something, trying to sell something. And, right. and we all have something of value that we're, we, we're able to share and we're able to sell, we're, we're able to trade with people. And I, it's funny to me when I listen to somebody and, and they go right into their thing. It's like, yeah, man, but tell me who are you and what are you all right. about? And I don't really just care about your thing because then you're just a commodity. Like that's, that's, I think we're all much more than a commodity. And when I hear the commodity, I just, it, it turns me off. And I, I think that that probably turns most people off because we're, I mean, shoot, Google's good for commodities, but it's not yeah. good for humanity. Right. That's right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, right. We, we spent a lot of time getting to know things. Now we're going to get to know you a little better with our FOCUS round. Uh, so FOCUS is an acronym. Uh, F stands for fun and uh, O, opportunity. U, uh, C for communication. U for understanding. S for success. So we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Hi, right, Mr. Damien. What do you do for fun? Uh, for fun, for a long time at the martial arts, I, I created Yokido. And, and so that's, that's been the essence of fun for me. It was traveling until we had a, basically a quarantine. Uh, <laughs> but you know, what, what I do for fun is, is engage people with teaching. I just, I get a lot of, of value. I love the, uh, I love the creation process. It's to me, it's art. So when you see a painter that gets lost in their art, when, when I'm writing or doing the peak life, the life by design, decade by design, building that stuff is so fun. And I think that the, the point of our lives is to find things where we get lost in them, where time disappears and where there is no clock. There's, we, we all of a sudden notice that the sun has been down for hours, but we're not sure how many. When you're in that space, that's, that's what teaching is to me. And so it, it goes beyond fun. It's yeah. like, it's why I'm here. And I think that that, that I, I hope everybody finds that. That's, that is truly my hope that not only do you find it, but you open up space to be able to live in that most of the time. That's right. Oh man. So what was one opportunity that was a game changer for you? Uh, opportunity. You know, when a buddy of mine in 1999 came to me and he said, Hey, I've got a deal and I was selling insurance and I had a path to make a million bucks a year selling insurance. Right. And I thought, no, you know what? Insurance is too small. And which is good. Most people are like, are you crazy? A million bucks a year. What is wrong with you? I'm like, well, I was not, I was like 20 years old. That's the problem. <laughs> so it million didn't seem like that much. And the opportunity was he gave me this deal and I said, yeah, I'm in. And it was the opportunity to take action. He just opened a door and I went through it, nice. took a cash advance out of my credit card for 6,000 bucks and bought a house. And then I learned how to <laughs> fall off a roof and get high from paint and flood the house, electrocute myself. Like I learned all these things and I survived. The opportunity was in front of me. Most of us have opportunities every day. Like Dolph DeRoos, old real estate mentor of mine, used to say, the opportunity of a lifetime comes around about every week. And wow. the question is, what do we do with it? And that was an opportunity I had. And it turned into hundreds of houses and teaching and becoming a multimillionaire and becoming a negative multimillionaire <laughs> and like all that stuff. So that that was one of the, the triggers. I mean, the, getting thrown out of school for the bookstore was a pretty big opportunity too. And you'll notice that I look at the mistakes or the big bloody noses as the big opportunities. Oh yeah. Uh, that, that first house I got killed on, you know, I ended up having a guy that just got out of Leavenworth and military, like federal prison. Yeah, yeah. And he was oh, wow. my tenant and he started growing marijuana before it was legal in the backyard. <laughs> like, you know, and he's, he's giving me cash. I'm like, I feel like I was like money laundering. I'm like, this is crazy. The, it could have gone to jail probably, you know? And, and those were all opportunities because I was in action. We are meant to be in action, not to be sitting idle. That's right. Excellent. So, uh, man, 
This has been great. I just love this. All right. C is for communication. What is the most important communication tip you'd like to share with us? Candor. It's, I, I mean, Jack Welch just died and I heard it from him years ago. He said the missing thing in business right now is candor. And that was, I, I heard that like 10 years ago. I heard him speak. It was right. It was, I think it was the week that Steve Jobs died. And I remember uh, him saying that and thinking, okay, what does that mean? It means we're just not willing to tell the truth out loud and be, we can be kind about it. Sometimes it's not kind. It's people's feelings get hurt. And instead of being honest, which is the best, bravest thing that we can do for somebody else, we tend to say the thing that makes everybody feel good. It's like kumbaya. And we tend to, we don't understand brevity. So my answer, one word, candor. Sometimes I'm brief and sometimes I'm not. We tend to just drone on and on. It's like, what are you saying? Get to the damn point so we can move on. People are like, blah, 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 blah. It's like Marcy and the peanuts. Blah, wah, 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 wah. Like, give me a break. Get to the point and be honest about it. Candor is the missing piece. People respect it. And quite honestly, we don't have time for all of people's yap. I completely agree. My, my wife uh, would agree with you 100%. Uh, that's one, one reason I love her is I never have to guess what she's thinking. <laughs> Anytime she's mad at me, I'm not like, what did I do? What did I? I know exactly what I did wrong and why she's mad. So I think that with candor, I like that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna C, is, C is also for candor. So communication. Yeah. There, candor. You go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. So, so obviously, um, based, based on a conversation, you have a lot of life experience that you, that, that you hold dear to yourself and you also teach and share with, with others. Right. Um, but what is one thing you wish you understood earlier? That mastery is not something you get overnight. It's, it's okay. something that there's a plateau process. One of my favorite books uh, is by George Leonard, who has passed away. He was a sixth Don, sixth degree black belt in, in Aikido. And in, in mastery, this applies to martial arts and life equally. It's, it's like Ray Dalio's book, Principles, the principles of life and business. It's all the same. And the plateau principle is, is this, when you're going along and you're doing something, there can be months and years where you feel like nothing is happening, where it's just the same. And I see this in the dojo, teaching people martial arts, and I see this in business, where it's like I'm going through motions and nothing is happening. And sometimes, many times, that is the plateau where you're just going and then one day, boop, you pop. And you pop to a different level of understanding and it's, it seems like it's out of nowhere. It's like, oh, I get it. And that didn't happen that day. That happened from a months long, years long plateauing process. Yeah. And it was this vibration. You're just building energy into it. And mastery is all about building energy by going through a process and being willing to commit where a plateau doesn't stop you. You don't quit. Most people quit and they don't realize they're actually on the path. They go, it's nothing's happening. Actually, something is happening. But you you don't understand the process of mastery. It's a journey. It is not a moment in time. There's never a moment where you're actually done. People say, "Well, I want to have this this thing happen." And I go, "So success." When when I wrote Reinvented Life, I talk about success versus fulfillment. Fulfillment is the journey of mastery. Success is what everybody's taught to do: go get that million bucks, retire, do this thing, and then everything is good. Those moments last a split second, and then what? So is the entire process your process, or is that moment your thing? And the moment is a pretty big waste of your life. <laughs> it's deep. Heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Heath, you're going to have a hard time editing this podcast. Yeah, no. no Good luck with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, finally, we come to ask success. To what do you attribute your success? Winston Churchill. Don't quit. Never, 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 never quit. Never, never and. Never. Until it's time to quit. I mean, like there's the, the success is to me, success is such a dangerous thing to be thinking about because I don't, I don't look at myself as successful. I just look at myself as being someone that's willing to commit and just keep going. I've had companies that, that crashed where everybody else bailed and I was the only one left and I basically just struggled by myself and I just was the only one that was willing to keep going and everybody else was looking for the next hit of, of crack. Like there, it's like the next high and sometimes it's just, it's, it feels like drudgery. And so success, I used to think that, that the purpose of life was happiness. Why? Because Aristotle said it and I thought, well, he's pretty smart. Like he's smarter than I am. So that seems like a good plan. But then there was a guy um, named Fred D. DeMonico that he's a doctor and he's, he was on, um, I interviewed him years ago and he said, that's not the point. Life is not for happiness. 
there is a process. And sometimes when you're in pain, you're struggling, that is the purpose. It doesn't mean everything. I mean, I, I was a good hedonist back in the 2000s, man. I was like Mr. Consumer, like whatever I was consuming at all. You talk about something that's fun, that feels good, get your endorphins going, your glands f- swollen. I was, that was me. And, and I go, okay, well, that's something that's consuming. I had no contribution. I wasn't contributing to anything. And, and so there is a part of our lives that's it's contributing, it's, con- um, it's, it's consuming. And part of consuming is being thankful. When somebody gives you a gift, whether it's a, they compliment you or they give you something, it's being able to, to consume that and circulate that energy. And that, that's a big missing piece. For, so like I had a hard time with it for a long time. I couldn't, I couldn't consume very well. I was like, ah, don't thank me. Don't give me a gift. I can't accept it. And, and so you know, there's, there is this process where success is just going through it. It's, you can't hack your way to success. It's not a moment... If you think that you're going to wake up at 50 or 60 years old with a pile of money and you're going to be successful and you're going to be happy and everything is good, you're an idiot because <laughs> you just wasted your life. Like if you've got to book your life, you've got to live your life and you've got to say, I'm going to embrace the suck. That's one of the things I think Jocko said that and it was in one of the SEAL books, embracing the suck. My friends that have been in special forces, that's part of the process it is, yeah. and that is success in that world and in our world all of us are special forces in some form or fashion embracing the suck is how it has to happen or you're never going to be happy you're never going to be fulfilled and you're never going to tap into your potential and wasted potential is a sin right that is a sin man that's the biggest <laughs> sin waking up one day and going ah oh, damn i missed out this is my last day on earth and that is truly a sin and that is not what we I, I don't think it's acceptable. I look at people and I go, you're, you're just, you're sitting on your potential, get off your potential and move, but they're sitting on it. And why? Because we're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of mistakes. And instead of doing, instead of being afraid of that, just ask yourself, why am I here? I'm not here to be afraid and cower in the corner. I'm here to make a difference. That's why I'm here. Whatever you believe in, I don't think the universe, God, I don't think you were put here to sit and play it safe. Defense is not how we live. Right. It's living out not living behind. <laughs> yeah. So Grant Cardone talk, talk about in, in, in his books, we talk about um, success is our, is our, um, uh, is our obligation or responsibility, uh, responsibility and our obligation. Success, uh, success is a duty, our responsibility and our obligation. And he, I like what he talks about when he, when he dives into um, I- integrity, right? How integrity is not just telling the truth all the time is, is, is actually not wasting your potential, you know, not going to work and, and be, I almost cuss, but <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not um, partially. We're not, we're not at Cardone level where you can <laughs> no. just drop, drop it on the no. podcast like that. <laughs> so not being partially committed to, to, to live in a happy life, not being co- partially committed to, to building a business or being partially committed to, or at a job, if, that, if that's, your, that's your thing, you know what I mean? Um, but in, integrity is, is actually um, living, living to your full potential, right? It, it, who, is it Yoda? I mean, I, and, and I like some of the stuff Grant says, and some of the times I'm like, dude, are you just, are you just a crazy person? But I also really <laughs> like him. Yeah. I, I think that if you look at deep wisdom from somebody like Yoda, like right. do or do not, there is no try, in the try, right? I mean, that's like, and people go, well, I'm going to give it my best go. I'm like, either commit or just don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's going to work. People go, well, if it doesn't work, then, you know, then I can say I'm trying. Trying is, is your way to excuse your, your, your failure. Oh, wow. That's stupid. <laughs> it, it's, and, and what it allows you to do is give it a half, half ass effort. <laughs> and it doesn't, you, you, hear me when I say this, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. What matters is if you work. Hmm. That is the key. You've got to work and you've got to commit with whatever you're doing, whether it's your family, your kids, your work, your business, your investing, commit. But trying, when I hear people say try, I pretty much, unless, in, unless it's going to be a disaster, but even then sometimes I do it, I go, wait, wait, wait did you just say you're going to try? try? Tell me no. Tell me you don't like my tie, Ben Fleck and Boiler Room. Tell me, tell me <laughs> whatever, but don't tell me you're going to try because it's, it's nonsense and it's you just giving yourself an excuse. And I just don't want to have a conversation with you. One of the things <laughs> I say all the time is I have rules around business and investing. One of my rules is that if you're not self-responsible, you do not get to be in my world. You don't get to be a client. You don't get to be a friend. You don't get to, get to be a business partner. And people that say, I'm going to try are not being responsible. They're being victims. They're telling me, I'm a victim. Give me a big V hat. 
I'm like, yeah, you're, you're definitely a victim because mm-hmm. triers are victims and that's just reality. And so if that, if that word's coming out of your mouth, I'm going to try, understand you're a victim and you're not being responsible and your life is going to suck. <laughs> Man, who, who would have thought that um, EQRP <laughs> would be about living your best life? <laughs> I'm telling I you, man, it. it, 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 it's, a, it's amazing. You know, so um, you mentioned something earlier that about a 14-page document that our listeners could get from you. How did they get that? Yeah, easy. You guys, most of you guys are listening to this on your phone or your phone's within five inches of where you're sitting right now or standing. <laughs> Uh, you probably, yeah, it's in your hand. So just text the word EQRP to 72,000. And there's the, the report that I, that I wrote will, will get beamed right over into you. And it's, it's a summation of the EQRP. Whether or not it's for you, there's probably somebody you know that is either retiring or has retired. Almost everybody out there right now is going, oh my gosh, what's happening with the stock market? I'm down 25%. This is an alternative for them to actually understand how to take control of that money and get off the damn roller coaster. I mean, texting a little word, EQRP to 72,000 could fundamentally change your life because it gives you the, the power and control over your money instead of just being a victim. I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. EQRP is power and control. Everything else is just smoking a bunch of hopium. <laughs> Hope is not a course of action. <laughs> but it is a doobie, you know? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> oh man well well damien uh we appreciate you coming on today uh how can our listeners get in touch with you specifically if they wanted to best thing to do is reach out to me on linkedin and and say hey uh and i'll give you a little tip with me or anybody else do not send me a message that's blind without like don't say hey please be my friend i will reach out to you i will personally reach out to you every person that it does that i reach out to and if you send me some canned thing i'm unfriending you if you just ignore me, I'm eventually unfriending you. Like, that's not the point of connection. If you want to have a connection, reach out. Like, I, you know, p- people are surprised because I'll get on the phone with somebody. I'll talk to somebody. And they're like, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I'm like, why? <laughs> you know what? I'm interested in you if you're interested in you. But if you're just trying to get okay. something from me or suck my brain or you don't really want to show up, like, I don't mind being helpful. But if you're, if you're just going to sit there and take it and not do anything with it, then you piss me off. So just think about that when, pe- when you're communicating with people. Oh, look, I have 5,000 friends. You're an idiot. You don't have 5,000 friends. How many people have you had a conversation with? I don't know, 12. Okay, so you might have 12 people, but you don't really have 12 friends. So just think about that. If you want to connect with me or anybody else, how are you showing up? Is it authentic? And it doesn't mean it's going to work every time. You go, I tried. No, just keep doing it. Plateau. Go for mastery. Mastery in relationships is the same as anything else. You got to show up. You got to contribute. You got to be willing to contribute first. Don't consume the relationship first. That's like looking at a fireplace and going, give me fire. I'll give you wood later. No, man, you got to grow the tree, wait a while, feed the tree, and then cut the tree down and then put it in the fireplace and then sit there and try to light the damn thing forever. And then it'll give you heat. People do this, this crap backwards. Like it doesn't, doesn't work. Give me heat. No, that's like relationships. I'm going to friend you and then give me all your information. Um, now, so just think about what you're doing first to contribute to other people, and you'll be amazed at what happens in circulation with the relationship. Boom. Oh, incredible. What a way to, like, <laughs> a nice way to, to end on a positive note. Thank you again, Damien, for taking the time to sit with us and walk through EQRP and just general uh, making your life better. Uh, we appreciate it so much. We know time's valuable, so thank you again. And, uh, Look forward to having you on again in the future. Uh, and uh, hopefully you've had some fun uh, during this past hour or so as well. Man, guys, Heath, Hutch, I, you know, I, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you guys doing what you do. And if, if it's not fun, I, I, I think this is one of those things Steve Jobs said. If it's not fun for too many days in a row, think about doing something else because yep. life is too short. Right. You know, like when my, when my dad got really sick, I, and he, we had our last conversation and I like sharing the story because I think it's impactful for people to really think and take, take inventory of their life. We sat there and he was stage four and I, I flew up to Alaska and we're sitting down and he looked at me and he goes, you know, there were so many things that I wanted to do. And I was like, whoa, that's regret. And it was because he didn't have enough fun and committing, committing to things that mattered in his life. And he was out of time. And we, we tend to not commit and we're not having fun. One of my clients recently reached out to me. And it was like my birthday a week later. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm working. I'm thinking about canceling a trip. He goes, dude, you got to have, you got to go eat more ice cream. 
And I was like, what? And he said, <laughs> yeah, man, eat more ice cream. I'm like, all right. So I booked my ticket and I flew and I went down there. It turned out to be a total disaster and a blessing. And it was because I booked it. I booked my life. And I, I had moments of fun in that process of having a disastrous trip. Right. So I, we, we've got to book it and just think about it. Am I having fun? Am I stressed out all the time? Why? Because I'm making a lot of money? Wrong answer. You're on the wrong path. If you're stressed out and making a lot of money and that is your life, wrong path. I promise. It's the wrong path. Got you. <laughs> oh, man. Well, right, Damien, really appreciate you. Yep. Uh, so thank you guys for listening as well. I am Dr. Heath Jones. And I'm Hutch, the Marine Investor. Out. <laughs>